Hello and welcome to another episode of my studio workshop series. In this episode we're going to look at how I made my cover of Jean-Michel Jarre's Oxygen Part 4 for my Synthesizer Legends Volume 1 album. Uh, in this episode we're going to focus mainly on how I built up the arrangement of the song because the arrangement is quite different from the original. I'm also going to show you the synthesizers I used for uh, making the song and uh, for this song and for the other songs I used only analog synthesizers and analog drum machines. I'm also going to show you how I mixed the song, uh, how I recorded it and mastered it in that particular order because I normally mix before I record. I have all my synthesizers connected to a digital mixer and I control them by MIDI uh, using my sequencer, a Cubase, a DAW. And while I construct my arrangement in the sequencer, I also mix the synths. So uh, the song gets mixed uh, at the same time while I'm building up the arrangement. So once the arrangement is ready, uh, then the song is more or less mixed and I'm ready to record it. If you're interested in knowing how everything is connected in my studio, uh, please check out my uh, studio workflow video. It's the introductory video for this workshop series and there I'm explaining uh, how everything is connected and, and how I make this work. So it's hardly any surprise why I chose this song for my Synthesizer Legends Volume 1 album. The song is an electronic music masterpiece and its composer Jean-Michel Jarre is a legend himself. Uh, but it wasn't that original version which I heard of first. Uh, it was in the early 80s when I was a kid. There was this show on, on Finnish television that was called Hittimittari. And this show presented uh, popular music and it was, had a huge impact on me as a kid because uh, it was the first time that I was able to see music videos basically. And uh, uh, the theme tune for that particular show was a cover version of Oxygen Part 4 made by Hypnosis. And uh, uh, this uh, cover version is really long. It was actually taken from the maxi version uh, of their cover, which is slightly different. And uh, uh, the uh, song was edited down into a two minute or one and a half minute version and put as a theme uh, for that uh, uh, television show. So that was my first experience of the song. So when I heard the original, I was like, uh, it was many years later, perhaps 10 years later, I heard the original and then I was a bit disappointed because I was like, this doesn't sound at all as, as uh, kind of rocky and punchy and, 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 and going uh, as, as I remember it. This sounds much more mellow and, and yeah, a bit dull, I thought at that time. <laughs> of course, later on, I, I, I really grow, grown to, to love the original version as well of the song. But it was this first uh, Hittimittari uh, version of the song that uh, uh, was so uh, influential on me. So let me show you how I did my arrangement of the song. First, I imported three different versions into Cubase. The first is, of course, the original Jean-Michel Jarre's version of the song, uh, recorded uh, in the late 70s. And then I took the maxi version of uh, Hypnosis Oxygen cover. This is an over eight minute long cover version of the song, uh, which is much more uh, rock oriented than the original. Then I also found this uh, Hittimittari edit of Hypnosis version. And the edit that uh, they made for the TV show in Finland, uh, that's only one and a half minute long. And that's the one which is kind of perhaps closest to my heart. So I wanted to use that as a starting point for my arrangement as well. So I've broken down the different versions into parts and I've colored the different parts or sections uh, with different colors so that you can see uh, if the same part is repeated then it has the same color and, uh, and that way you can, you can follow a bit uh, uh, how the arrangement goes. So uh, the beginning I follow very closely uh, to the maxi version of the song. It's just uh, slightly shorter. So let's break down the beginning and uh, see what we have here. As you can see, the audio tracks are all muted. So uh, what you're listening to is the synthesizers uh, playing uh, through the digital mixer and uh, being controlled uh, from uh, the sequencer here. 
and the mix is the same that I had on the final version of uh, the, on the album. So in the beginning we only have drums and bass. Uh, so let's check out the bass first. Uh, the bass is a Daysmith Tetra uh, that I'm using. I have a patch called Unison Bass. I can't remember if I have edited it as fully possible. I've edited, I usually edit presets uh, and I also make my own presets. And uh, after you <laughs> had a synth for 10, 10 years, you don't remember anymore that uh, have you edited the, the preset or not, or, or is this some your, of your own creations? But I'm quite certain that this was probably a preset that I edited slightly. Anyway, it sounds like this. Uh, so uh, it just stays on the same 16 notes in the beginning, uh, but then when uh, we go to the main part, then uh, uh, we start with a riff. I mean, the original has a, a riff like... Uh, Uh, but the uh, maxi version, uh, hypnosis version, uh, has more of a driven uh, 16th note rhythm, which goes like... Oh, sorry, let me take it like this. The snare is really important in this more rock-driven song. Uh, so the snare consists of two different components. Uh, we, first we have a, a Jomox Airbase 99 uh, snare drum, which sounds like this. And then I also have a, a xenophone, a hypersynth xenophone, uh, that sounds like this. So together they sound like... So then we also have a kick entering uh, after the first few bars of only snare and, and bass. That kick is also the Jomox Airbase 99. Then we have an Alpha Juno 1 uh, chord entering and this is the only time that this chord comes in the whole song. <laughs> something like that. And here you can hear uh, a, a second Alpha Juno, an Alpha Juno 2 entering. And that Alpha Juno uh, sounds like this. So that Alpha Juno sound is being introduced here. And uh, then uh, in the maxi version of the song, there is also a kind of a funk bass feel uh, uh, that comes trading uh, uh, leaks <laughs> with, the, with the Alpha Juno sound. And, uh, but I didn't want to use kind of a completely new sound here. Instead, uh, I wanted to introduce the sync sound, kind of the lead sound that is uh, used later in the song as a solo sound. So, and that I programmed using the JX8B. So that sound is also later being used for the solo part. So I'm doubling that sound uh, using another xenophone uh, that sounds like this. And together they sound like this. So then we have everything we need for the introduction part and the intro sounds like this.
So that's the intro, and then we have uh, the main part coming. Then for the iconic main lead sound, uh, for that sound uh, I chose to use the synths that I have on tour, because uh, uh, when I created this arrangement I made it for my uh, Urban Dreams tour in 2022, and uh, I knew I was going to use the uh, Alessis Andromeda and the JX3P uh, up front. Uh, I have a Kiwi modded uh, JX3P that I uh, had on tour with me. And uh, I used it mainly because uh, there is this uh, Clear Skies song that I had a, a bass line that I really needed the JX3P for, so I used that on several other songs as well. And uh, uh, what I started with uh, was something like this. <laughs> So it's kind of an Oberheim brass type of sound. And uh, well, it sounds perhaps a bit weak uh, f for a majestic lead, but uh, what I did was I also used my JX3P as a layer. I layered it with that and the JX3P sound sounds like this. I also have it here, uh, I mean, control it by MIDI. Uh, uh, so I don't need to stretch that far. <laughs> um, and this is a much softer sound and I put a mo more reverb on this as well. But uh, I couldn't get the attack solely with this sound uh, as, as I wanted to. So, but when you combine these two, you get actually what I was after. So you get kind of the attack from here. And it works also as kind of a reinforcing the, the brass sound uh, on the JX3P. So they work really beautifully together, I think. And then the final element for making the A part is a pad. And uh, I used the uh, MKS70 uh, for creating uh, this pad sound. Partly because I had it already installed in the rack for my tour. <laughs> so it was an easy choice because that's uh, one of the synths that really has a great sounding pad. So the second time round I introduced the funky synth from the Maxi version. And uh, that synth sounds like this. And that's made with the JX8P. And something that I always have to remember live is that you have to manually increase uh, the pitch bend uh, uh, to its maximum position. And I think the maximum position is like five, uh, seven uh, semitones. So that makes this, uh, uh, it's really the pitch bend I think that makes that sound, uh, especially here. And it's even used like, uh, uh, like gliding between uh, two chords. And then of course, pitch bending down. So this is really fun to do live, but live I've programmed the, the, the pitch bends and modulations because I'm also playing the lead with my uh, left, uh, my, I think it was my left or right hand, <laughs> I can't remember right now. Uh, I'm also playing the lead, so then I need to be, uh, have my sequencer controlling the pitch bends and modulation of the JX8P that I also play with my right hand. So all together it sounds like this. You could hear there was uh, this uh, noise hit as well, this slow noise hit. And that noise hit, uh, which sounds like this. 
that comes from the Oberheim Matrix 1000. And the nice thing with the sound, this one I programmed myself, is that uh, uh, it has key tracking. So if you, the higher up you play, the, the sharper the sound will be, the, the cutoff will be higher. So you can use the same sound for have many variations of that same sound uh, just by playing different uh, uh, notes. <laughs> then we come to a break section. And this break section is actually the ending of the maxi version uh, because the Hittimittare TV show took this ending and uh, used it in their edit as a break of the song and it works perfectly. Uh, now when I listen to the hypnosis version I feel it's a bit um, it gets a bit boring, I would say, at some point. But uh, uh, this ingenious move of inserting this uh, uh, ending, basically, as using it as a break, it works really nicely. So I put this uh, break as well into my version and it comes like after the first time of the main part and also after the second time of the main part we have this break. And yeah, it really like glues it together and it gives like a breathing space so that your it feels again when the song continues it's like yeah I don't I don't know it's just uh, it really gives like a good break <laughs> and the break sounds like this and then we continue So that's the Alpha Juno 2 and uh, you could hear there's a pad underneath as well. And this pad is, uh, uh, starts with one note from the Alessis Andromeda. And then the uh, MKS-70 enters uh, together with the A6. So the MKS-70 plays a pad, a chord, and uh, the, the a a uh, Andromeda A6 plays uh, uh, one note. together they sound really nice. And then we have uh, uh, the second melody entering here. And then I added a drum fill because uh, uh, I felt that, okay, we need a break here, but I didn't want to repeat uh, the ending. And uh, then I thought, well, <laughs> it's a kind of a rock song. So what's better than a tom fill? And uh, the tom fill is made using the Jomox airbase, something like this. So that's the Jomox Airbase 99, high tom only. So that's only one tom generator. Uh, the reason for this is, is that the Jomox has, uh, Airbase has only uh, two toms and one high tom and one low tom. And I wanted to do like a run of several toms and the low tom sounds a bit also uh, different to the, to the high tom. So I just use the high tom. But what I'm doing is that uh, I have an old M audio trigger finger, the original version, and that can send uh, a CC value at the same time as it sends velocity value. Uh, so I have, have it set so that it tunes the Jomox tom uh, 
uh, differently for each uh, uh, pad. So, so I can do something like this. So they all have a different tuning. It's the same one, only one generator, but it's instantly when I hit it, it also sends a CC data that tunes the tom. And this happens so fast, so you can't even hear that it would be tuned like at the same time that I hit it. Uh, and this works really beautifully. You can even do like flams, like. Uh, really nice, using only one tom generator. Uh, but uh, I do have to do some uh, automation in the mixing, and what I'm doing is that I'm uh, adjusting the panoration. So uh, while I play the run uh, with each uh, kind of different tom, uh, so if each different pitch in the tom, uh, I'm also adjusting the panoration so that it sounds even more like it would be different toms playing. So you could hear how it went from kind of left to right. And yeah, so that worked really well for, for this tune. So in addition to the toms, the kick and the snare, uh, snares, uh, we have uh, hi-hat and cymbals. And that's the only uh, uh, drums in this song. And uh, the hi-hats and cymbals uh, uh, sound like this. And that's made with the uh, 808. But then we go back to the main part again, and this time around, uh, basically the second time uh, that the main part comes, uh, I introduce a completely new element that hasn't been in any of the previous uh, cover versions or originals, and that is a, a trans pad, <laughs> or kind of a trans brass, that sounds like this. And uh, we put this together with the mix. Let's listen to what it sounds like. But it's lower in volume, so it, it sounds uh, like this. So it's really barely noticeable, but it already introduces this element because later on it's going to uh, uh, have a bigger role, which I will show you shortly. <laughs> so the main part uh, with the lead goes around uh, uh, two times. And then the third time it introduces modulations. And, and these modulations were also in, in the maxi version. And the modulation sounds like this. And then we come to the second break. And here I introduce a completely new part uh, using this uh, uh, trans sound. Uh, because I didn't want to go back again to the uh, kind of the B part. Uh, I wanted to have something completely new and perhaps something uh, completely uh, introduced by me as well to this arrangement. <laughs>
that trans uh, pad or brass or stab uh, is uh, uh, made also with the uh, uh, Alessis Andromeda. Uh, so I have several sounds, as you noticed, uh, using the Alessis Andromeda. And the reason why I usually have many sounds live with the Alessis Andromeda is that it has uh, multiple outputs. It has a total of four outputs. So I can mix uh, like uh, different parts and it's completely multi-timbral. So I can mix different parts uh, separately, uh, making it uh, a really flexible instrument for live use. So at this point we go back to the second melody and uh, uh, here I uh, took from the original the idea with having kind of a longer solo in the end. So that made it uh, at least live much more fun <laughs> to play and uh, yeah I hope it introduces as well some variation to, uh, to this whole mix. So the solo is the next part which is played with the JX8B. and then the tones. And then we go back for a final A part and an ending. And here I have a, a, a lot of elements. We have the, J, uh, the, the Alpha Juno uh, uh, sound uh, uh, playing, uh, uh, kind of responding to the, to the main lead. And then we also have this uh, 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 new trans element. So there's a lot happening here. Then it goes uh, one more time through and then uh, we have the ending. So that's the ending and what's happening as you can hear there's a lot of delay normally in this sound. There's really a lot of delay happening. Uh, most of my synth sounds, it's really not much. It's just like equali some equalization, sometimes compression on, uh, and, and then uh, uh, usually a lot of delay and reverb, sometimes a bit of chorus as well. So that's usually it for, for, for all of the sounds, I would say. So there is a bit of automation in the ending to make this work. The ending is uh, according to the maxi version and uh, uh, what happens is that the, the delay goes away so you don't have any delay in the ending anymore but I have automated uh, the return all the return effects are under one DCA fader. So I just can uh, like move one fader and then I can adjust uh, the effect return level. Uh, so in the ending, uh, I'm just basically cutting uh, or, or cutting, cutting down, fading down the, the re effect returns at the same time as I'm fading the direct signal of the Alpha Juno 1 up. So that works really nicely for this, for this type of thing. And that way the song ends really dry. As you can see, there is quite a lot of volume automation going on in the stereo effect return channel. And uh, this is because I want to have a kind of a sort of a pumping effect. Not like necessarily a noticeable one, but uh, I, I really want the effect return 
to kind of duck when the kick's happening, just because then you get more of a rhythmical feel to the song. So let's listen to what it sounds like when I have removed uh, the uh, automation uh, from the stereo effect return channel. Uh, that sounds like this. And then I'm putting it back. So you can hear that there is more of kind of a, 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 a rhythmical effect just by lowering on each uh, kick uh, hit uh, the stereo effect return. There is also some other uh, uh, volume automation happening, but mostly because I'm uh, shutting synths off, uh, basically turning the faders to zero when they're not playing, uh, and then I'm adjusting the volume a bit depending on uh, the role of the different instruments at different uh, uh, points in the mix. Uh, but uh, that's essentially it uh, uh, for the automation. I almost forgot one sound, and that's the uh, Jupiter 6. Uh, there is a Jupiter 6 drone coming in uh, when we uh, go, uh, kind of when the modulation part is being introduced, and uh, also during the whole modulation part. And that goes like this. Just these low drones, like. A really efficient sound. Uh, <laughs> something that I, I think I was overusing on, on this tour. <laughs> that was the main sound that I brought the Jupiter 6 for. <laughs> and then we have the whole arrangement in place. Uh, not that many different elements uh, and not so many layers, uh, okay, some layers, but, but not that much. And uh, if we check out the mixer, we can see there is, uh, there is many channels grayed out, uh, meaning they are not in use at all. It's kind of an economic mix, so to say. But it's also uh, partly because I made this uh, uh, for uh, going on tour with, and uh, then I really had to think about that what is necessary and uh, how many mixer channels do I have, uh, what can I do so, uh, with the scenes that I am bringing with me. This mix also makes quite heavily use of, of side chaining. So uh, what I do is I have a uh, kick drum, is both the kick and the snare actually, is feeding a, a side chain bus. And uh, that side chain bus uh, uh, is being listened to by many of the uh, instruments and uh, it activates uh, the, the gate uh, docking. Uh, uh, the gate can be used as a docker as well, so what, ha what it happens is every time the kick hits, then uh, it docks the signal. And uh, uh, you can see it's used on the JX8P, on the uh, uh, hi-hats cymbal uh, knot, uh, but the pad, uh, the trans uh, uh, stab, uh, even the melody and uh, the Alpha Junos uh, and uh, uh, the MKS-70 pad, uh, so it's used on many elements, also definitely on the M200i reverb. So it's used in many places and uh, we can again take a small section, loop that and listen to the changes uh, when we have the sidechain activated and when we have it deactivated. So let's, let's listen, listen to this loop here. Now it's on, here you can see it working. Now it's off. And now it's on. Here the effect is really big because the trans sound has a, a, a quite a, a, a hard attack, so it really like overpowers the kick drum. So uh, for that particular reason, I, I really wanted it uh, to, to be lowered during the kick. Now if we listen to the whole mix, let's check the same thing. And now let's mute the side chain. Back on. So 
it really helps the kick and the snare to come out and it kind of forms kind of a, uh, yeah, kind of a gel you could say. Uh, so it, it, yeah, I really like how it sounds like. Makes it sound a bit more modern as well. If you're interested in the details of the mixing process, uh, you can uh, check out my other uh, previous videos uh, because there I'm explaining more uh, perhaps uh, my, for instance, my kick sound and, and also uh, uh, equalization aspects. So then the arrangement is ready and the mix is ready and uh, then it's time to record it. So I recorded it into a few different stems. I recorded the kick separately, the snare separately, uh, the bass separately, uh, and th the bass was actually a stereo bass uh, because it's uh, the, the tetra has the, the uh, some penetration uh, spread going on between a, a few layers. Then the lead separately, uh, the uh, effect return separately, and then something that I call the rest. <laughs> so everything else bunched together. But I tend to bust out the important things because when I mix the album later on, uh, then I usually want to have, or when I master it, I, I want to have an opportunity to, to uh, rebalance something if needed. Mostly it's like kick, uh, bass, uh, lead, uh, reverbs. And, and these are things that when you start to compress the dynamics of the, the mix, uh, some things start to sound louder than what you wanted it to be and then it's good to have these possible choices later on. I recorded in several takes as you can see the reason is that because these are analog synths uh, the every every kick for instance is generated anew and sometimes there are always like small differences in the sound with each hit and uh, sometimes there might be things that clashes uh, uh, all of a sudden uh, frequencies that clash and then you uh, the easiest way to fix that is just for instance to take another take and 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 uh, cut and paste that uh, into place and that works really nicely. Uh, and sometimes what I do also is, uh, especially for these type of uh, beat-driven uh, uh, versions, I usually uh, take uh, uh, all the kicks, uh, uh, all the kick takes, line up them next to each other, and then I listen to the kick, and if there are like odd clashes or weak hits, then I just uh, uh, cut and paste the kick from uh, a, a different take. And that works really nicely. And as you can see here, that is what I have done for both the kick and the snare in this case. But other than that, uh, I didn't have to uh, use the other takes that much, but mainly for the kick and for the snare. So normally I would be ready to master it by now. But then for the album, I uh, wanted to have some fun, so I did a separate uh, or an additional analog submixing stage. And this is what I did. So once all the stems were recorded from all the songs for the album, uh, then I did a separate uh, additional mixing session, uh, kind of an analog mixing session, where I took uh, the stems and, uh, and drove all of them through an old analog mixer that I have with some additional analog hardware. Mainly because I wanted to see, is there actually a difference between uh, analog summing and digital summing? But partly also because it's just so much fun, more fun to work with an analog mixer. So uh, let me bring in the stems and let, let, uh, let's listen to what it sounds like. The kick first. Snare. And then the stereo bass part. Lead and then the additional rhythm section and then the effect return. So quite a simple setup for this one. So let's make one more test and listen to the difference between analog and digital summing. Is there any difference? Um, so I've prepared a test for you. I recorded the song uh, through the Mackie mixer with all, all the signal levels uh, on, 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 on zero, uh, I mean on, on normal. <laughs> so uh, no equalization on and uh, no, uh, addition, no additional hardware or anything, just uh, uh, mixing uh, through Mackie and then as a comparison mixing through Cubase. So we first listen to the Cubase, then we go into the Mackie mixing and then Cubase mixing again and then Mackie mixing and then back to Cubase mixing. So let's listen to what this sounds like.
it's really difficult to say. I mean, just listening like that, you wouldn't, if I would have a, a cross-faded bed or the, the, the cutting sections, you wouldn't even notice that there would be like a two different uh, uh, mixing, uh, uh, mixing uh, one software and one hardware used. I mean, I, I'm actually positively surprised that I was, I expected that the Mackie to sound much worse because it's an old mixing <laughs> desk and that was, at that time it was a relatively uh, uh, cheap, like meant for project studios and uh, it actually sounds really good I think uh, but let's take an even closer look to the summing uh, let's take two bars first Cubase then the same two bars mixed with Mackie and then again the same two bars mixed with Cubase and again with Mackie so you can really compare is there any difference at all so let's take a listen Hmm, the Mackie sounds perhaps slightly less bright, but in one sense, uh, I mean, what I get the feeling of is that the Mackie is, uh, uh, the analog mixer is kind of more forgiving. At least that's the, uh, the feeling I get from working uh, with, with analog uh, mixers, is that there you can do more adjustments and uh, uh, it, it's kind of more forgiving. I mean, also, already just listening to the levels, I mean, it's, it's, you can set the levels manually and get like close to the, to the digital version. And uh, I don't know, but uh, there is, uh, uh, for me, it's, it's partly because it's fun. And uh, uh, also when you start to add uh, like uh, equalization and uh, analog equalization, for instance, and then you add uh, uh, in the chain as well, uh, have a, uh, uh, an analog uh, equalizer and uh, have a master bus compressor. And uh, somehow everything being connected analog, it's, it's kind of works together really, really nicely. And, uh, and yeah, it's fun. <laughs> One reason also why I choose to work this way is that I feel uh, working this way with analog equipment is kind of much more forgiving when you uh, uh, stack up like equalizers and master bus compressor and, and somehow everything blends slightly better together, I think. Uh, of course, just like comparing uh, the purely the summing, it's really challenging to find, uh, find any differences. Uh, uh, many of the differences can just be attributed to, to perhaps, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, that you don't have an exact same uh, mix. But I, I like to think that it's a bit more forgiving. At least that's what I feel like when I work with it. So before going any further with the mixing, uh, let's uh, plug in uh, the equalizer and the master bus. Already with the equalizer, you can hear uh, both of them both the equalizer and the bus compressor use uh, transformers. So uh, already just by plugging the, the equalizer in, I mean, even without having an equalization on, you, you can still hear a difference. So let's listen to this. I have the equalizer on a separate bus and then the, the, the main mix on a separate without the equalizer uh, on, a, on a separate bus. So let's, let's switch between these two and listen. with the equalizer, without the equalizer. It's like it's already slightly bit brighter perhaps, or kind of a bit more detail perhaps through the transformer. So let's also switch on the actual equalizer, uh, equalizing section. And uh, uh, I, I did some comparison earlier myself and I realized that, yeah, I prefer it to run it through the equalizer completely. So, so let's, let's have a listen. Uh, I'll definitely add some more bass. I'm not sure about the treble, but I will add a bit anyway. Just so I can hear if there is any uh, anything that I don't like in the upper registers. I can uh, usually uh, add a bit more uh, uh, high uh, frequencies when re uh, recording and then uh, when mastering I take them down a bit. Just so I don't he can hear that is there anything that sticks out that I don't or are there any nasty frequencies. 
Uh, okay, so uh, let's keep the equalizer at that and then let's check out the master bus and bring that in. I'm also using the uh, transformers on the, on the master bus compressor because I, I like how they sound. So this is without. This is with. Without. Again, it adds a bit high frequencies, perhaps a bit definition, and I like it. So, uh, and uh, I'll, let's put on the compressor as well. Here, I uh, normally tend to take just a couple of bars and uh, uh, loop the bars, and then listen to the se uh, settings for that one. But let's—I've uh, done it in the previous two videos, so let's make this quite, quite, quite quick. I usually have it at 4 dB working and then I loop one section, listen to how it works, too much I think, 3 milliseconds sounds quite nice, I usually leave the ratio at 2 but then I play with the release. Sounds quite nice. Let's keep it at that. And again, I have a high pass filter on the side chain so that it can, uh, the signal that the master bus compressor is listening to is being filtered because otherwise it would respond, especially in this song, too much to the bass frequency. So let's try to take the filter off and then put it back at 105 where I have it. So, first without, you can see that compressor is working quite a lot and it's pumping a lot. I put it back at 105. It's pumping much less. So uh, uh, this song is already, I mean, there's a lot of side, chain, side chaining happening with other compressors. Uh, so so I, I don't want the master bus compressor to, to do too much here. Uh, so let's see what I have on here on the, before going into the analog domain, let's see uh, what I've done. So first of all, uh, you can see that I split the, the uh, uh, lead bus into three. That's because I have, uh, 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 on the same bus, I have different uh, different leads. We have the, uh, this thing going, <laughs> the main lead, and then we have this uh, uh, brass section, well, not brass, sorry, the sink. And this one really needed some additional, I felt, equalization. It was a bit too bright, so I put on, I, I put it down uh, from the five, kilohertz and, uh, and, and uh, removed a bit of that and then I even put a separate uh, separate uh, yeah I split it even further up because here's a lot happening so I felt this needed a bit more equalization in the high end to make it uh, less uh, uh, intrusive so that's why I split that bus up and uh, then I think I did something let's see what I have on the kick uh, yeah, there is some minor equalization uh, still on the uh, various buses happening, really, really minor to be honest. Uh, and uh, I think I don't even have any inserts except for the rest seems to have, a, oh yes. So I have a compressor on the insert, and uh, sorry, on the, on the rest bus, which is kind of the bus which contains all the uh, uh, other rhythmical elements. Uh, let's see what that does. <laughs> So yeah, so it's it's going to listen to the kick. Yeah. So the kick is 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 uh, 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 triggering the compressor, making it duck a bit more. Here is without it. It's with the compressor. You can hear it's ducking a bit more, a kind of rhythmical ducking, uh, which really suits the song. Uh, I already had it on uh, uh, in the, during the basic mixing, but then I realized that I really wanted a bit more ducking to happen. Uh, so that's the nice thing uh, when I record, uh, when I keep these uh, recording sessions, I, I mean, at some point I have to commit. And then it's nice to be able to record uh, uh, like the different stems uh, into the into cubes because then I still have a possibility during the the uh, kind of the mixing session that I'm now keeping, and then later on when mastering. So so the, uh, this is uh, really nice. And uh, as I did uh, with the other songs, uh, to make a bit more a, a, a kind of struggle with getting a wide enough uh, stereo image. So uh, I put on the effect return bus. 
uh, I put a stereo imager. Here's without the imager and with the imager on. What it does is it widens quite a lot in the high frequencies and mid frequencies, and uh, uh, but only for the effect return. I have some other things playing here now again, so let's let's put. This is only the effect return bus. Without the imaging, with the imaging. So it adds some nice width to the to the to the whole to the whole mix. Let's listen. We can also listen to it, uh, uh, bypass it uh, with the whole mix on. So let's see how what that sounds like. Now it's on. Now it's off. Now it's on. It's almost like you would lose a lot of the reverb delays if you don't have enough uh, uh, wide uh, uh, image there. Uh, so, so that's one reason also why, why I'm busting out because when I have uh, uh, these different uh, uh, stems, I still can do things when I realize that uh, if I realized later on that ah, it's still not uh, as good as I wanted, then I still can do some manipulation to, to the to the uh, different parts. Uh, so. At this point, then I'm, uh, uh, yeah, then I, I start, start with the analog mixing. The kick is really good here already, but because I had this tube equalizer, I just wanted to, to boost the kick a bit more, make it even fatter. So let's bring the, the, the uh, tube equalizer in. I'm inserting it on channel one already makes a difference, but let's make a bit more, so let's boost around 60. Okay, it brings a lot of, of the mid uh, frequency at the same time, so let's reduce those. This is quite nice, so I'm, I'm boosting with 3 and cutting with 2. And uh, the, the tube uh, EQ, this is a Paltec clone, and what it does, it kind of uh, makes the, uh, when you cut, it cuts, and, uh, it cuts and boosts at the same frequency, which is a bit weird, but the curves are different. And th I think the cutting curve is more narrow, while the boosting curve is more wide. So when you uh, cut uh, with a narrow curve, you get kind of a tighter uh, bass response. And uh, that's, uh, 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 that's what it sounds like to me, at least. And then I, I want to boost a bit in the high frequency still, not much, but uh, perhaps not the, the 3 kilohertz. Four is quite nice, but we can bring it down a bit again, so I bring it down on five kilohertz a bit on the key. That's quite nice, but I want to uh, bring up the bass. And the bass uh, is, has a quite nice region around the uh, low mid, and the low mid is quite broad on the Mackie mixer. All right. So let's engage the equalizers, and uh, I'm cutting for the return. I'm cutting for uh, the the synth part cutting the low frequencies, just below 75 hertz. Uh, and then we bring in the, the, let's go back where we can hear the bass. So now I'm boosting the low mid, but this is too low. So let's take it up to, 350 is really nice with this bass. And then we can reduce, uh, low, mid instead and rub around the same frequencies for the lead to make a bit more room for the bass. I think I'm reducing at the same time the same regions for the return. And uh, I think I did it also for the kick. For the kick I, 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 I re uh, reduced around 250. Yeah, because that's kind of the boxiness that I don't need. Not much. A bit on the snare as well, around the same region. 
The snare can do with a bit more high frequency, uh, high mid, I think. Kick also, possibly. Something like that. Boosting a bit the high frequencies on the on the bass as well. I think I boosted the high frequencies on the return channel as well. And I think I uh, lifted the level on the on the synth channel. That's more or less how I did it, and then I recorded everything as a stereo track uh, into Cubase, and uh, then I started mastering. Uh, for this uh, song it was pretty straightforward, because I felt like I had gotten everything quite well already during the main mixing. So first I have an EQ, I think I wanted to boost the bass a bit more. So that's what I did and I reduced a bit on the 200 hertz frequencies, a bit more around 4, hertz, 4 kilohertz, and then I reduced the high frequencies as well. Uh, before going into the uh, mix bus, oh, sorry, the master bus, I call it mix bus here. So this is the chain I used. I didn't use this, I didn't use any low end focus this time. Uh, some dynamic EQ on the kick because the kick was a bit too high. Uh, if I don't have the, the dynamic EQ on, it's a bit perhaps too much in the, in the uh, 60 hertz region. So I put the dynamic EQ on to take that down. And uh, I still added some, a bit more less on the 200, a bit more around the mid and I reduced the high frequencies even more. And uh, I put some stereo widening on as well. And again, I used the match EQ to match a bit uh, more my references. This is without it. This is with it. And again, I uh, I stopped it uh, uh, at eight kilohertz. So above eight kilohertz, I wanted to use my own uh, uh, EQ curve. And then I put. Uh, 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 multiband compression on and then last a limiter. So that's it. That was how I made my version of, of Oxygen Part 4 for the Synthesizer Legends Volume 1 album. Uh, if you like this video there are uh, several other uh, videos in this series as well that you can check out and there will be more to come. So uh, remember to subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. So until next time.